First, live, local. This is Fox 12 Now. Welcome back to Fox 12 Now. We are continuing our live stream here from the Fox 12 Oregon newsroom, as we do every weekday, starting from 1 p.m., going throughout the afternoon, uh, getting to have some longer-form conversations, and that is what one of these is right now, is with Reed College student Jossam Hussein, who is part of a, well, really, a, a pair, a team, who discovered eight exoplanets while utilizing n uh, data from NASA. He goes in-depth on that and explaining that a little bit better than what I can do, uh, but it's really a fascinating thing, and actually some firsts were part of this discovery. So let's jump right into it. Here's Jossam. All right, well, Jossam, thank you for having some time to talk to us today. I'm excited to hear more about this project and, and really what you discovered and how that all happened. But I think to give everybody some context, you know, because what you're doing there is such, uh, you know, incredible work. Can we give somebody uh, just kind of the base level of really, you know, for you as, as a student, as uh, somebody who's studying this field, what drew you to astrophysics and astronomy and everything in that field to begin with? I think, uh, you know, broader sense, a sense of curiosity with the night sky is something I've had since I was a child, uh, as, as a lot of people would, I'd assume. But uh, when it comes to exoplanet science and astronomy from a, a professional point of view, uh, a, lo a large part of it came when I was looking up at the research, uh, looking up uh, the research that was, go uh, the research that was performed by my mentor, Dr. Michelle Kunomoto. Uh, so uh, she, uh, she had a record where she actually discovered four exoplanets as an undergrad. And I was always fascinated by how an undergrad could go on, take data from, you know, a NASA satellite, which in that case was Kepler, and then go on to discover exoplanets. And the whole, you know, the, the process behind it got me very curious. And then uh, I didn't know ways down the road I'd be working with her, sort of doing that as an undergrad as m myself. So, uh, yeah, so it's, it's a mix of both. So general curiosity from, you know, you see the achievements all, you know, all around the world with all these space agencies, uh, accomplishing things, but at a personal level, looking at the research of my to be mentor years before we even worked together. I think that's what drew me towards exoplanets in particular. And uh, and we're here now. So yeah. I mean that's pretty incredible that you know you were studying this and, and her work beforehand. Now you get to work with her. And uh, to give everyone just that context to that base. So you're at Reed College right now. This was a study as part of MIT. Can you explain to everybody just how that works as far as this program that you were a part of? So this, uh, the, the research that I performed at uh, MIT Kavli Institute for Astrophysics. So that was part of uh, a funded research project from Reed. So uh, the Center for Life Beyond Reed funds, you know, funds research projects that students take, uh, uh, you know, well across of, I mean, well away from Reed, and uh, so the research wasn't associated with Reed, but was funded by Reed, and gotcha. yeah, the project itself involved looking at known uh, planet can, I mean, planet candidate systems that were observed by the transiting exoplanet survey satellite, which is TESS, uh, that was launched by NASA a couple of years ago, and uh, making an additional search for new planet candidates within systems we knew who have hosted candidates already. So that was the main idea. So we conducted what we called a, uh, a multi-planet search for about 7,000 stars, which we knew uh, hosted planets as observed by TESS. So, yeah. And that's through that, through that uh, NASA data that you received. So these are planets or, or, or star systems that you already knew had a planet. You're, and then you're going back through that data and reanalyzing it, see if you, seeing if you can find more exoplanets within that same system. And, you know, how do you go about doing that? How does that pr process work? So you have, I'm sure it's just a massive amount of data that you're receiving. How do you filter then through that to try to find more exoplanets? Well, the idea is, so I can speak about the code end or I can speak about how the transit method works. I'll do both. The, the main idea behind our planet search methodology is the transit method, which is the most convenient and the most powerful tool we use right now for exoplanet discovery, which is looking at starlight and looking for periodic dips in starlight, which could indicate some kind of activity 
that could be interesting potentially. So uh, as far as the planet search process goes, we have data that, you know, we have a lot of data which uh, contains the flux or uh, the flux of a star, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and, you know, so we have from tests light curves for all of these stars. So that's the first thing you collect. The, the data is all open source. So you go out there, you collect the data and you clean it up you make it ready for processing and different stars are observed in different test observing sectors. Test is constantly in orbit as well, right? So you uh, process the data, stitch them together. And then, uh, you know, I spent a few months writing the program, which could, you know, then just take the data that we have and start the search. And once you, once you're able to recover the known planet using the search, you mask out that planet and run the same search again now to see if there's any fainter signal. And those are the main signals we're looking for, right? So you, you run your search, find the planet we knew already existed, mask that from the data, and then run another search to see if our algorithm uh, can look at anything interesting at that, can find anything interesting at that point, right? So gotcha. that way, you, we did this for up to four new candidates, and then um, automatically and manually carefully vetted them to ensure that these candidates were worth being discussed about in a paper and we came down to eight in the end wow which is you know amazing utilizing all of that all that data and just kind of iterative okay found one let's see if there's another one let's see if there's another one and mm -hmm. um and there was something really special about what you found you know with this and could you let everybody know you know with this discovery there's something unique that uh, that was really brought out with all of this data yeah, there were a couple of interesting systems, one of which really stands out. So there's one uh, candidate that we found, which was the second candidate in a five-planet system. Now, back when we were searching, this was known to be a one-planet system. And then there was another team uh, which discovered three additional candidates to that same system. So now we know, subject to confirmation, uh, we would have the fifth 29 sorry 29th five candidate system five planet system with that one but the bigger and the more interesting one from a from a from an exoplanet science point of view is we discovered a closing giant companion to a hot jupiter now hot jupiters are a class of exoplanets which as characterized by the name they're very close to their host stars but also you know off the mass and radius of uh, nearly jupiter uh, 20 to 25 years ago, we never expected hot Jupiters to have many companions. In the last five to 10 years, we've found companions to hot Jupiters. However, they never crossed the size of Neptune. And I'm talking about close-in companions, so of a certain, rate, of a certain uh, distance that can be considered close-in, uh, which you know, creates an interesting dynamic stability argument uh, as well from a time evolution point of view. Uh, but what makes our candidate interesting is that we found a close-in companion to that hot Jupiter that is even bigger than the hot Jupiter. We're talking about the order of 10 Earth radii. So we found another candidate that's even bigger than the hot Jupiter that we already knew, which was, as of this moment, uh, it hasn't been identified before. And it also is subject to confirmation, uh, but is very likely a planet candidate uh, as far as we're concerned. So hasn't been seen before and would allow us to rethink about hot Jupiter formation mechanisms uh, once again, uh, look at it through a different point of view. We thought they formed so violently that they would you know, annihilate any possible neighbors to now having another giant companion in, in, you know, in their close-in vicinity. So uh, that's what makes this candidate particularly interesting. Yeah, yeah something that, that hasn't been seen before. And how does it feel for you, you know, to, to put in this work? You, know, you talked about how as a kid, this is something you were fascinated with. You're going into this as an adult. You're studying with one of your, uh, you know, your mentor, really. And, and now having this data out there and seeing something that's really never been seen or documented before, how does that feel mm -hmm. for you to go through all of that, all of this work to get to this point and now have that out there for the world to know what you've discovered? I mean, it feels amazing. It took about 15 odd months of work, you know, uh, learning how to do the, you know, learning how to, get the code running and it was a it was a slow iterative process where you keep learning uh you know the bits and pieces as you go on and once you're done with the research then you tackle another beast called writing a research paper and that took several months you know 
how do you communicate your findings in a way that is acceptable to a scientific journal? And it's, it's very different from just communicating about our findings to the general public. Right. So that process took a while. So it feels very, it feels amazing just to have our results out there, given the amount of time we put in. But also at a personal level, uh, this was something I hoped to do before I came to read. I mean, one of the goals I had in mind was to, you know, take part in some kind of project which involved looking for exoplanets, uh, at least by the time, you know, uh, that I hope to graduate. So uh, it feels good to have completed that achievement, uh, completed that goal of mine, uh, and, you know, now it's on to something perhaps more interesting or more discoveries along the same line. So at a personal level, it's very fulfilling. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I would imagine. I mean, it's got to be. And and congratulations on that, too. You know, setting out, you. setting that goal for yourself, all that hard work and then getting to that. And, you know, for everybody out there, too, you know, you're at you're at Reed College. Um, and what is it about Reed? You know, just to just to cl clarify that as well. What is it that drew you to Reed College to begin with? What drew me to Reed? One of the main aspects of Reed is the uh, the importance to scholarly rigor, if I can put it that way. Right there is uh, obviously the the physics program here is one of the most rigorous programs in the country, uh, no doubt about that. And also there is also an attention and encouragement for research in general. Um, you know, when I spoke about this opportunity to faculty uh, in the beginning, even before I started, there was a lot of encouragement on that side. So uh, Reed has a reputation to prepare you for graduate school in a way most schools don't. Uh, there is a high emphasis on that, and we have a great turnout when it comes to preparing people for grad school. So uh, I think given my hopes of going to grad school at some point, I had to, it was a no brainer for me to choose a school that you know, puts me through the most rigorous curriculum and also prepares me for grad school in a way that it wouldn't be all foreign to me when I get there, hopefully soon, God willing. So, uh, so I think that was it. There's the, the, the scholarly rigor and the uh, importance that is paid to research, uh, especially in a small liberal college like Reed is what attracted me to it, sure. And did pay off. Yeah, I was gonna say, it's obviously paying off. Uh paying off for you. So you made the made the right choice on that. It's far from home. It's definitely far from home. What's that? It's definitely far from home. So I'm yeah. um, but, uh, where, where is home? So home is in Chennai, India. Uh it's a city in the south of India. Uh, that's where home is. Yeah. Yeah. So a uh, long ways away. <laughs> oh yes. <laughs> I'm sure quite a I'm sure it was a bit of uh probably a little bit of a culture shock too, I would imagine coming into Oregon from there. Yeah, I came from an engineering school in India, and yeah, the, the, the scenery definitely, right? You're used to more of the heat, and uh, rain is torrential, whereas, so culturally speak, oh, from a cultural point of view, I've never had a lot of time to engage with Oregon. I, I'm starting to more now, uh, a little too late, but I'm starting to more now, because the academics at Reed usually kept me occupied, at least as far as I'm concerned, there's an adaptation that's involved when you come from one system to another. So most of, you know, my time is spent working or you know in the springs looking for opportunities for the summer so i've been kept occupied on that end but uh yeah for an indian coming you know from from what i've seen this is unlike a lot of things that i've known before also from an academic point of view so uh they did definitely take some adaptation i still think i'm learning yeah, yeah. well i mean that never stops i would imagine ever mm -hmm. um, but i am still gonna fall in love with oregon that's for sure yeah that's awesome well, Dustin, anything else that you think is important just for people to know about your discovery and the work that you all are doing? I think the, if there's one thing I could say from you know, what I've learned uh, working with TESS and, you know, uh, in exoplanet detection, as far as I'm concerned, is anybody could do it. Now, this is just one example that you're seeing here that I was able to, you know, with the with with a mentor able to take this data, process it, and find exoplanets, but it really could be done by anyone. And there's a lot of open source uh, data available. Uh, there's a lot of open source code available. The data is obviously open source from tests. So anyone with the interest could find um, 
resources along these lines to go on and uh, to a large extent replicate what we did. So, uh, you know, while it seems like, you know, I mean, it, it seems interesting and all that, what, what, what it really is is, you know, if someone was interested enough, they could do exactly what I did. So uh, it is more accessible than people think now than ever. So I think that's what I would put out there. I think that's one of the most exciting things about it is that it does, you know, give that, if somebody really is, as, as you mentioned, you know, really wants to pursue it, that they would be able to, to you know, access some of that same data and have that out there for everybody to look at. Well, Dawson, you know, thank you very much for having some time to talk to us today, too. I really appreciate it. And congratulations on this. Um, you know, I'm excited to see whatever it is that you, that you go on to next, whatever it is that you're going to discover, whatever project that is, because clearly when you set a goal for yourself, you, you know how to accomplish it. So um, thanks for talking to us today. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure. All right, so really interesting things there. And again, you know, being done by a student uh, here in at Reed College. Uh, Jossam, I uh, appreciate his time for joining us. And thank you to all of you. This is Fox 12 Now. We live stream here from the Fox 12 Oregon Newsroom, as I said at the beginning, every weekday. And uh, we have all kinds of different conversations that we have on here. If you ever have something that you think would make for a good topic, feel free to send me an email, Fox 12 Now, Fox 12 Now at kptv.com. And uh, we'll see if we can do something. Can't guarantee every time, but it's always uh, we're setting it in and we'll happily take a look at that. So feel free to do so. And uh, that is it for right now, though. Remember, if there's breaking news between 1 p.m. and 4 p.m., this is also a place to, to go to. And uh, we will send out an alert and I will be here to bring that to you should that happen. But for right now, I will talk to you later. I'm Greg Nobody. This is Fox 12.